Okay, shall we get started? Everybody uh, sitting comfortably and got their sandwiches and so on. Uh, today we're going to welcome uh, Saul Griffith, who is a highly creative and unusual character, may I say, from, uh, with roots from uh, uh, the MIT Media Lab. And I know that's going to appeal to a lot of you here today who have a, a Media Lab uh, kind of activity. Uh, many of the people you saw in the audience are prototypers and designers, and uh, you can just tell by looking at them once that they're not ordinary geeky kind of engineers. They're, they're, they're fun. And so um, this is going to be a very interactive session, if you wouldn't mind, um, and uh, challenge Saul on some of his designs. He's going to come over to our lab later on from 1 till 2. He's meeting George, I believe, at 3. If anybody wants to hang out with Saul, if you like from 1 o'clock till 3 o'clock, you're welcome to come over to 2117 in Etcherbury where we have the prototype and stuff. And uh, it is a great pleasure to see him here today and hopefully uh, get some more interaction between the Berkeley Labs here and Squid Labs. So thank you very much for coming. Thank you. Great pleasure meeting you and everything. And uh, please enjoy the group. They're a fun bunch. And, uh, Welcome to Challengers. Great. So I've, I've been, it feels like I've been traveling for about a month and uh, I kept thinking tomorrow I'll prepare something for the Berkeley talk, but tomorrow it happened at about 11.50 today. So this is more going to be me talking about the stuff I'm thinking about and scrambling around my desktop trying to find uh, an example to fit. Um, and it's nice that you say that my origins are in the media lab, but in fact it's nice to return to the Hearst Mining Building. I don't know that anyone here knows this. I was an exchange student at, uh, in material science here in 1994-95, when you weren't actually allowed in this building. Um, I think that was pre-earthquake proofing, or whatever it was. Um, so I graduated from Media Lab uh, with a PhD about 18 months ago, and then started something called Squid Labs, which is sort of an independent research laboratory. Whether it is possible to run an independent research laboratory it's still unclear to us, but we're surviving. Um, at the turn of last century, there were a lot of independent research labs, um, but it seems to have shifted a lot more to a, you know, there was Edison and, and the Wright brothers and all of that sort of independence. There's not so many examples of that, so we're trying to see if that's still possible. We work on a bunch of things. You're based um, in Emeryville, right? Based in Emeryville. We are literally 15 minutes away. We are definitely looking for hot employees and interns. Um, if I can say that in my life, so that. That's what you mean by hot. Good, good hackers. Okay, that's All right. what I mean by yeah. That's okay. It's Berkeley, I have to say that, right? Um, so as I, uh, I do a lot of different things, and actually most of the people at Squid Labs are a little uh, diverse, so the easiest thing to encapsulate what we do is we say, you know, I, I do hardware. Um, I recently said this to a venture capitalist, and his reply was, how quaint. Um, I was, you know, my whole life is hard. How can you say how funny? In, in my boiling furor, I didn't figure out what to say to him. And in retrospect, I should have said, you know, if we look at the, the problems in the next century, you know, clean water, clean energy, more functional materials, building high complexity structure, complicated, whatever it is, they all look to me like sort of hardware problems. Um, but I guess they still live in a different world. So I'm probably going to cover. Uh, too many topics, given that I only have an hour, um, but this is sort of things that I have been thinking about and actively working on. Uh, I'll start with uh, my thesis work. Um, for those of you who haven't graduated yet, the warning is it may not finish when you graduate. Um, <laughs> I'm still doing some of this work. So uh, within the Media Lab, I was in the Jacobson group, which was called Molecular Machines, and we had very strong materials uh, and uh, materials processing focus, figuring out new ways to build things at um, sort of sub-micron scales. So we did a lot in printed electronics space. And my particular thesis was on self-assembly. So uh, some of you, probably everyone here is, uh, knows roughly what self-assembly is. I was interested in this thing. So this is, you know, we build uh, circuits right now, and they're all essentially 2D. And they're, they're complex and, and highly architected structures, but in reality they're just sort of layers of 2D. Then on the right we have a radial ara. This is a unicellular organism that's ubiquitous in the world's oceans. Uh, and it patterns what to me is a much more complex structure. It's, it's actual 3D topology. 
the resolution of feature sizes that uh, radiolar and diatoms get down to is 10 to 15 nanometers, and it's building in inorganic materials. So this is actually silica, and they also build in calcium carbonate. And how do you actually, you know, the, the problem to me in self-assembly was how do you build, or how do you get this, uh, this the, the very highly complex structure? Um, so what's the rough size of that one thing on the right? Uh, this is about 20 microns or 30 microns across. Um, so it depend, they, they vary between 5 microns for the smallest diatoms through to about half a millimeter for the very largest radiolara. Um, and the, the 10 nanometer feature size is if you sort of zoom down in, there will actually be more pores and more structure. It's almost a fractal type thing. So I spent six years writing a PhD thesis. Um, this is something I'll talk about later, but it's a good way to introduce this particular work. I also now work on cartoons and the power of illustration. Uh, so what I took six years to do and, and 200 pages, uh, the illustrator I work with, Nick Dragotta, did in one page, um, where this is our Kitty Tucker. He sort of notices that using surface tension on the, bowl, the, on the surface of the bowl of milk that his Cheerios self-assemble and you can actually try this at home, it will work. Um, but then you can start doing interesting things, so patterning the hydrophobic, hydrophobicity, hydrophilicity to generate sort of different crystal structures, which gets him to thinking, well, how do I pattern those things such that I can build something truly <laughs> complex and something that also self-replicates? Um, so that was kind of what I did my thesis. I saw the corny joke in the bottom, I don't know whether I saw that. Uh, I was hoping they didn't, but oh. you were, uh, the, 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 the corny joke, of course, is that was surreal, or was it serial? Can you read it? You can't read it from back here. Uh, that might be lucky. So, uh, this is, you know, self-assembly, state-of-the-art, or, or state-of-the-art a few years ago, was essentially not much beyond patterning a few edges of, of single components to build larger crystal structures. But if you look at these crystals that they're building, I can't get an arrow to point. Um, do we have a laser or anything? Anyone? It's not terribly necessary. Um, but you can see these structures on the right, they're actually, you end up with defects in these crystals. And if you really think about the complexity of these, they're not much more than, than crystals, and so not really the complex 3D structure we're after. Um, of course, you know, obligatory thesis slide, Self-assembly is worth from nanometers to millimeters. Uh, these are self-assembling peptides, making tubes. These are micron-scale pieces of silica, uh, silicon that have been patterned uh, and self-assembling into 3D crystals. And this is the sort of 2D on the surface of the water stuff. Um, but I was, again, more interested in how do we get to self-replication and how do we get to arbitrary complex 3D structure. So biology has some interesting things that goes on. Um, I should have blown this up. So this is basically, the interesting thing here is, is the polymerase and the ribosome. You can think of these are like the, the little supercomputers in self-assembly. So literally, uh, polymerase does a very nice job of doing the, uh, the unwinding and, and the replication. And the, the code for the complexity, because as I look, started to look at self-assembly, it's, it's more of an information processing problem than anything else. Um, so how do we get that type of computation into inorganic or synthetic systems uh, so that we can do self-replication, etc.? So I want, you know, this is sort of the mental model and then this is sort of what I want to do. How do I take a very minimal set of parts, um, be able to introduce a complex part, have that complex part replicate, and then have it generate a three-dimensional structure. <coughs> oh, there is the blown-up version. Okay, so here's our little supercomputer. Um, so I started to think, how do we introduce a concept of state machines or computation into self-assembly? Uh, and you know, the most basic state machine you can imagine is this is a little component that, you know, if A binds C, it changes this uh, opening such that it can now bind B. So you can imagine this is a very simple state machine. This sort of gives you an if-then statement in self-assembly. Uh, so from there, and I'm going to go way too fast, interrupt and distract me if you like. Um, from there I actually wrote out, this is a, a minimal or 
a very simple state machine that will actually <coughs> work. So at the top here, each one of these is a very simple state machine and it's programmed such that you know, the first unit comes in here and binds. This, the one meaning this is open to binding. That locks on, changes the state and everything. The second one can go in. That change updates the state. The third one can go in, etc. So we start to replicate. Um, redundant slide. Uh, this is starting to look at how you actually route this logic mechanically. This is the first prototype in Lego of a uh, five state linear replicator. So what does that actually mean? Uh, I will try and go to a movie. So, having looked at all the the state machines, I now actually built these five state state machines in little mechanical pieces. So these are just laser cut acrylic. You can see both of these parts are in what I'm calling the neutral state right now. No matter how you bang them into each other, they won't bind. If you change the conformation of the latches, and each latch just has a sort of a zero or one position, you can now build a string. And this literally correlates to the state diagram I showed you previously. Now you can see the first one attaches, then the second, then the third, then the fourth, and what actually happens is it detaches the previous one as it goes. So from one you get two, from two you get three, and all of a sudden you have a mechanical virus. Um, I also have just switched to Macintosh yesterday, so I'm still struggling with how to use it. Um, so, you just saw it done with hands, just to prove that you can do this um, hands-free, if you like. This is an air hockey table. These are the same finite state machines. You can see we started with one input, green, green, yellow, yellow, green. Just call that a binary string. And you set these things in motion. I've had to speed this up at the size scale I built these, which is about an inch. Uh, it all happens a lot slower than sort of chemistry scales. Um, there's just random air being introduced from the side of this table, which is providing the agitation. And so literally we're implementing sort of asynchronous uh, cellular automata and the, the state machines are updating. So the same thing you saw happen in the, the hands done slide is now happening autonomously here. And hopefully, luckily I've seen the video so I know the result. Um, you can see that the green, green, yellow, yellow, and the final green attaches, those two will now separate. I just in post production I added the 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 the, digi the the green and yellow stripes are added digitally just so you can see it, otherwise you just get dizzy and it's not obvious what's going on. So from one we have two um, and then both of those two now go go forth and replicate further. Uh, the nice thing about this system is you start if you track the kinetics of it you can use the traditional uh, kinetic models and you can see that this is sort of a an exponential process limited by the number of parts, so it slows down, so it really is sort of um, uh, sigmoidal kinetics. Does it always happen in the way you programmed it? Sorry? Does it always happen in the way you programmed it? It does. There's, um, it really, except for mechanical errors, which would happen one in a billion times, or often enough to annoy you, because this takes eight hours. Um, although this was the very first time we ran it, it, it replicated. Um, but the state machines, in some respects, they are error correcting. It won't bind the wrong component because uh, there's sort of little mechanical locks that prevent the in incorrect bindings. And that's actually the difficulty with the, uh, designing systems like this is not in designing them to execute the program correctly, but designing the mechanisms so the wrong thing can't happen. Yeah, and which it turned out to be a hard design problem. So you can see from one we end up with four, and some of those like this guy. I've already started replicating the next line. Uh, there's a little bit of latency in the logic, so that's why there's a few extra parts. That will actually detach just with a little more agitation. Sir, question? So is it easier or harder to design at the micro scale for the non error uh, I think it is the same. I think the design and the logic, the design logic is scale independent. Mm -hmm. um, Finding a material system and a mechanism system that will do it is is a difficult search process. So I really this was very conceptual work trying to point the way for self-assembly to realize this information processing problem, and then also 
um, sort of, if you like, provide a blueprint to an inorganic chemist to say, well, actually, you can think of an allosteric molecule as a state machine. Um, you know, if bind A, then open, now you have a new binding site. Literally, this five state state machine can be implemented in three allosteric <coughs> molecules or three light switches. So it is conceivable, uh, granted unbelievably hard, <laughs> that you could build an inorganic self replicating system with the right set of gained molecules. But then it, the, the difficulty in designing for that, again, is preventing the bindings you don't want from happening. Yeah. So what's really interesting is that this space or the vacuum. So, did you start with the size of the air hockey table? Yeah, it just slows everything down. The smaller it is, the faster everything happens, and it's really just a mean time to collision. Even when it gets crowded and you have more structures, it doesn't start, things don't get locked up, you don't have like percolation type effects? Oh, you can end up, we ran, so we ran different state machines to do other assemblies, such as building a perfect check, checkerboard, because one of the problems with self assembly is you always get these errors. So we actually built a, a different algorithm that did error correction, so you would only ever end up with a perfect crystal. And the way it grew, if the crystal would eventually grow large enough that it would wedge itself in the board, and, and then you'd get all sorts of errors happening. Um, but we didn't get, we didn't spend a lot of time on experimenting with that. Hopefully, someone will fill in those gaps. Um, so. So we now know how to, that you can replicate with literally five states an arbitrary bit string. So it could be green, green, yellow, yellow, green, or it could be anything. So I was now interested in the second half of the problem, well, how do you produce an arbitrarily pre-programmed complex structure? And so, again, borrowing from biology, uh, the reason you replicate linearly is because you only have to have one information front. If you're trying to replicate a 2D thing, you've got to have your, you know, you, you, it's much harder to get information out. But also, there's this nice thing called protein folding that shows you can do a linear piece and fold a 3D object. So the problem then came, is that in fact what I would call 3D complete? Can you fold any three-dimensional object from a linear string without interference, etc.? And so, obviously, mathematically, you start in 2D and think about it. Uh, we have a very simple rule set again, so if it's, a, if it's AB or BA, go turn right. So that would mean that this interaction would turn right at this uh, vertex. And if you have similar AA or BB, fold left. So I've switched from green yellow to AB, but you'll have to forgive me the, the nomenclature problems. And it turns out that you can fold, um, you could determine a sequence that folds this B, or in fact, um, if you think about it, uh, you can now encode those magnetically. You're, uh, you only need two, or in, in, the weird thing is, in, in 2D you need four tile types, in 3D you need only two tile types. That's more detail than I want to go into today. Um, so, just but this in a 2D case, if you have you magnetically encode the tiles, so it's north south, north north, and this one, uh, etc. etc. Basically, you can imagine these things build a crystal. If you carve out the letter you want, this actually implies the sequence. So this sequence, pink, blue, pink, blue, pink, yellow, green, will fold along this front all the way through the M, into the I, into the T, and then switching awkwardly to video again. Um, there's this I don't know if it's the same here at Berkeley, I suspect it is, because you build MEMS versions of the Campanile, but at MIT, Whenever you do a demo, you need to kind of have MIT somewhere in it. Um, so the mental model here is it, this works as long as you're constraining the folding to occur sequentially. So this is slightly different to protein folding, which has longer range interactions. But this is just nearest neighbor interactions. Um, and you can see this folding. Uh, the sequence is actually, these are, are defining it. Again, this is run on an air hockey table. These have little neodymium magnets. These are about <coughs> eight, eight millimeters across. I believe. Um, so you can do 2D. Uh, I won't go into the. Um, I won't go into the all the details, but it turns out you can do this in 3D also. Um, so you basically you, you borrow from graph theory. You can reduce any structure to a um, a graph that has no loops, uh, and then you can 
basically go in and out. So what am I trying to say here? This picture should convince you, if you stare at a wall for four years, as I did, that you can fold any 3D object by virtue of... Um, so these are a little... Imagine each one of these is your voxel. If we consider in the 2D case, each tile is a pixel. In this case, each one is a voxel. If we divide the voxel into eight sub-voxels, I can now show you that there is a routing, that if I start at this point, I can go into this guy, come back in, put in this space, go down, come back up, go this way, etc. And you can imagine now, sort of by addition, that you can build any 3D object, and because you can route from anywhere to anywhere, you'll be able to come up with a single loop that folds your 3D object. And then in the... I guess I can play... Um, you can now start to define comp more complex 3D objects like this dog, and this is actually, you could call it the gene sequence for that dog, um, and so 01001, where you've defined some magnetic polarities, means that you can fold any 3D object. So, uh, I'm now doing a lot of this work with Eric Domain at MIT, who's an uh, analytical geometry math guy, and we're just writing up our final proofs on you can fold any 3D objects. So hopefully that will sort of indicate that um, if you want to build a complex structure, you really need to be able to program enough information into the assembly system to define the output. And then this is one of the ways that you might do that. How fast does that algorithm run? If I give you a geometry, can you generate this sequence? Yeah, actually, in the same way that um, <coughs> if I go back, in the same way, so this crystal, you can carve out any approximation of your object from this crystal, and that process actually implies the, um, the sequence that you need. And that also works for 3D. So I don't know, not being from a really high math background, I don't know what you say. It's, it's not NP, it's, it's, it's sort of fairly linear and fairly fast to compute, apparently. So does that answer your question? Yeah. Um, yeah, I came from a material science background and ended up doing a thesis in math which, and logic, which was a little strange. So I still probably don't use the right terminology. Um, so that was interesting. That's a slide from some other uh, talk. Um, maybe just to, to sort of give you some background at the, the environment I was in when I was doing this work, there was also a group, uh, the Open Biology Group at MIT, if people know this. Um, if you don't, this is unbelievable and stuff that's very worth, interesting and worth knowing. So led by Drew Andy and Tom Knight, this is a group of biologists who are, uh, well, they're actually mathematicians becoming biologists and saying that if we want to program and build interesting things in biology, they're actually defining individual proteins, if you like, as subroutines that you can gain together in a larger program to build things. So... Um, what does that mean? This is literally a, this is a two-bit uh, counter, and they are now defining um, protein pathways that you can actually build counters and build logic into uh, biomaterial systems, uh, which sort of leads to the same sort of thing of, of programmed assembly in biological systems. Um, the first example of this was actually, this published was built by University of Texas students they were working with, who basically designed a protein pathway that would be, um, you might have seen this in the literature, it's, uh, it, it's basically a photographic film made out of biological components. They, the photons hit the, prote the, the one particular proton's receptor, and that, um, that sort of gets programmed down and creates a color change. So this is kind of an interesting world to me to think about, because it sort of is the intersection of material science with computation, where you can start programming function and, and real programs, if-then statements, into your materials, and either using that for assembly or for a higher function of materials. Um, so, switching tack completely now. Um, I, you know, we were, obviously it was in a laboratory where we were really looking, if you like, at materials and the universe as a computer, and that you could execute programs in that universe to do interesting things. And uh, this is, if you have that sort of unit, that, that view of the universe, and I guess this was um, sort of started in the AI lab in the 70s, 
you start looking at a droplet of water and thinking, well, actually, this is the universe is performing computation, the state is the surface tension, the energy. It turns out that the computation on this drop of water on this sort of low energy surface computes a perfect lens for you. And I got involved at that time in a project to build, uh, or how do you, there are a billion people in the world who need eyeglasses who don't currently have uh, access to low cost prescription glasses. So we built a system um, where we program literally a couple of simple, uh, we program the, the, the physical mechanism and then when, the, when physics executes the program it produces a perfect lens surface. So you see me changing the shape of this uh, annulus here. If that is a circular annulus, we'll produce a spherical lens. If it's an elliptical annulus, you'll produce an astigmatic or uh, biaxial lens where the ratio of the cylinder to sphere is the ratio of the two sides of the ellipse. Um, I'm now putting, this is literally car window tinting film, so just aluminized mylar. And you can see as you apply the pressure that you are getting, uh, I'm sweeping through all possible lens surfaces. Um, so this is just a little uh, calibration system to make sure that that works. Um, we are eventually going to use this membrane to mold a lens. Um, this, the previous surface you saw was uh, concave. This is a convex surface, so you can actually do both surfaces of your lens. Um, once the lens surface that you want has been determined and measured, uh, we will now pour into this a UV monomer. Uh, this rubber band, this video is about three or four years old, so the technology has changed a little bit. But in essence, this is sort of next year's Ray-Bans <laughs> frame shape. We pour in a uh, UV curable uh, acrylic monomer, uh, trade name CR39. Um, anyone here is wearing glasses, they're made of this polymer, uh, CR39. Uh, polycarbonate is a much smaller percentage of the market. I'm putting a, a, an optical flat on the surface of this just for the purpose of this video. Uh, literally three minutes of curing now. And uh, the magic of Julia Child's video editing, three minutes is up. We reverse the pressure on this system and that will pop this lens off that surface. Now pull that out and literally snap your finished eyeglass lens out of that frame. Uh, video camera is going to struggle with the autofocus, but you'll be able to see here that that's actually about a minus two lens. It's got about a half a diopter of cylinder. So you can see the distortion when I rotate the lens. That's the, the cylinder or astigmatism of the lens. So this system is, uh, is quite interesting. You can, you can mold any lens between plus 8 diopters and minus 12 diopters up to 4 diopters of cylinder. Are yep. there any good spherical lenses, right? Uh, there is a mild A sphere <coughs> introduced. Yeah, but I mean, is that an aberration? I mean, not presumably um, an aberration correction. That's what you mean. You can control the aspherity by the stiffness of the membrane. And depending on what... But does that give you actual uh, aberration correction or is it just a random change? It can give you aberration correction that you want, but you have to choose the membrane thickness appropriately and, and the, the system. But fun, fundamentally, yes, this produces spherical as opposed to aspherical lenses, but that's like a third order uh, effect in, in eyeglasses. So in, this was designed for making very cheap lenses in rural communities uh, rather than for sort of Western markets. Um, but we have actually generalized this to do all a spheres in the sense we are now controlling the stiffness of the membrane locally everywhere. And uh, imagine a balloon dog. If you have a weak point on the balloon dog, it, you'll get a, a bubble out there. So by controlling the stiffness of the membrane everywhere, you can actually produce any arbitrary surface that's continuous. And so that, that can also do, for example, progressive advanced lenses, so these multifocal. So how do you control the uh, stiffness locally? We're controlling the stiffness right now electrostatically. Um, so you've probably seen these systems. You have uh, electrode top and bottom of a, uh, on both sides of an elastomer. Sure. And you put high voltage, you can actually squeeze that elastomer locally. So 
in effect, you're modulating the stiffness of that. No, in, in this case, it's not changing the stiffness. It's, it's, it's changing the geometry. geometry. Yeah. Which, you, depending on how you look at the equation, it's sort of the, the analogous thing. We, we have experimented with other systems where we actually change the, system, the, the stiffness. Uh, but the most success we've had right now is, is with that electrostatic system. Um, we're looking at a, a, another version of this where you, um, you laser score the, uh, the surface and then you can do any arbitrary <coughs> geometry. So it's like a 2D to 3D transformation. That's for a different market. But for this particular system, we were looking at how do you make a lens for sub 30 cents anywhere um, from, a, from a very cheap system. Um, part of that project also was uh, <laughs> the second problem in that project, project is how do you, in fact, maybe the more important problem in terms of global eye care is how do you test the prescription of people very cheaply. So right now, it's the, the dominant cost in providing eyeglass in a lot of places is the cost of the optometrist. Um, so we were looking at building a, if you like, reducing the optometrist to an algorithm and building a wearable a wearable optometrist. So this was the device. Uh, just quickly, what we're doing is we have a variable optical element. You can imagine it's similar to the, <coughs> the variable uh, surface we were using in the, in the molding device. So you look through this variable optic at the world, and you basically now measure. You sort of put incident rays in here in the IR, and then you read back from the photo detectors whether or not they have cancelled. So if the combination of this lens and your eye is, is myopic. These rays won't converge here, they'll converge short, and you, the, the, the reflected sort of indicate which direction you have to go. So we're basically doing automated retinoscopy by this technique. So it's sort of, in, it's sort of changing the, the paradigm for um, vision testing. In most sort of auto refractors that exist, they take an absolute measurement of all aberrations. In this case, what we, all we really want to do is get the basic uh, refractive error, so where um, sort of if you like, you start you start this lens way out in the positive, and then you just run a uh, is it better, is it worse type uh, algorithm through your um, photo detector array, and you converge on a lens that cancels the error in the eye. So we're also uh, working on that right now. Um, so I've gone a little longer on those. Uh, and I might like two. Um, the other thing that is I spend a lot of my time doing right now is thinking about instruction. Um, so how do you uh, how do you describe or teach or, or do instruction sets in an interesting way? The most uh, flippant example of this is we're uh, writing sort of engineering how-to books for children. Uh, so I'm going to show you. We're using the same illustrator, Nick Regatta. Um, and the idea is essentially we're trying to make engineering and science a little adventurous and mischievous again. Um, and so within all of our stories, we actually embed the instructions on how to do something. So this is a fairly trivial example. Uh, little brother decides he declares war his sister. Um, sister leaps over the couch, grabs the rubber band off her hair, produces a rubber band pistol, and then it's, it's classic face-off. This is our uh, introduction to the book. Um, you know, they have a room, they have a workshop that looks about as tidy as mine. Uh, to give you uh, another example of the types of projects we have in this book um, and the way we're sort of approaching putting the adventure back into engineering, uh, these are the kids are sort of imagining the invention of ice cream um, where they go on this long adventure, they gather, uh, they gather salt, uh, ice from Norway, sugar from Persia, vanilla from Mexico, and milk from Northern Europe, and they're traveling back with their hapless donkey as they are walking down the hill, the donkey falls over, magically the salt falls in the ice, everyone knows that you lower the, uh, you lower the temperature drastically that way, all of the ingredients for the ice cream so happen to fall onto the, to the ice. Naturally, you have a cherry that lands on top. Um, lucky you don't see the dialogue for the bad puns in this one. Um, so they return from their adventure they've just had, and this sort of shows you the instructions of how you can do this 
within your kitchen. So I'm showing you samples without the lettering for those of you interested in the... I never knew this, but there's actually a very specific person in comic books who just does lettering. So comic books are now a production line manufacturing technique, which is interesting to learn about. Um, maybe to show you one of my favourite projects in the book. Oh, this is our safety message. Everyone says, uh, you know, we live in the land of liability and we're going to be encouraging kids to do all sorts of dangerous things. So I didn't want to have the traditional safety disclaimer in the book, so we convinced the publisher to allow us to have this as the safety disclaimer. Um, so poor kid's asleep, he's cutting out holding toys, starts, gets all excited because he's made this great thing, running with scissors, classic example, and sort of the theory of this is the kid will be so horrified by this mental image that it will hopefully make them a little safer. Um, <laughs> yet to be determined, come back next year and see if I still own my house. Um, same as the, the sister has an example. We actually use this to lead into a story on actually how you make your own pair of crude safety goggles with a soda bottle. Uh, actually, these are surprisingly effective um, glasses. I'm not sure I have the video. Uh, but why, why would you want safety goggles? And of course you'll want safety goggles because you declared war on your sister earlier in the book. She's now getting her revenge. Uh, she throws you your safety goggles. You put them on. All of a sudden you're being shot with marshmallows. Uh, you run away as fast as possible, you go and look through her bedroom, you find the plans that she used to build the marshmallow shooting PVC gun. Um, you build your own, you learn how it works, you figure out the physics, and you're ready for revenge, and lo and behold, you know, your sister is up the ante. Um, which seems, I had an older sister, and uh, it seems that this is how it works. So, that's fun. Um, Possibly my favorite project in the book is this one right now. Uh, this is the kids were thinking about, uh, you know, how, how do the how do, uh, hippopotami make their sort of mating calls, if you like. This is my favorite image in the book. So we sort of got the, the hippo's ass and how wide it is. <laughs> really what he's thinking about is, uh, well, I guess you'll get it, figures out that with a, um, by taking a rubber band and a little, and a uh, coat hanger wire and a washer. You can make this little device, you wind it up, you sit on it, and lo and behold, you're making the main call of the hippopotamus. This is like the open source whoopee we'll we'll cushion, if you like. Um, so anyway, uh, this is probably the, this is the image. Unfortunately, just, you know, social commentary. Uh, this is the image we're getting the most strife from from our publisher in terms of liability, because they don't want us to encourage kids to dumpster dive. But you're, uh, you're, you're the results of dumpster, dumpster diving kids, right? So uh, it seems like there's something wrong in society if uh, we're not encouraging a little bit more of this behavior. Um, so I might end there. I cover too many, too many things. Uh, I might show actually one more fun video. Um, something I'm thinking about in, in doing all these children's projects. Uh, what I'd really like to do is to make a library of um, how-tos and how do you most effectively make a library of all how-tos. And so we're sort of taking to, to very tenuously tie this back into the original part of the talk, which was thinking about the nature of structure and information and how information defines how you build things. We're sort of taking a programmatic approach to um, design and assembly. And so can you take all of the subroutines uh, so think about drilling a hole as a subroutine, think about um, tying a knot as a subroutine, think about using a hacksaw as a subroutine. So can we make a very large library of little videos like this one? We sort of cartoonized this with some software we wrote. And, uh, you know, so this, this is really just hot off, you know, what I'm thinking about a lot right now is can we make literally a library of a thousand of these Sort of things. In this case, we're just tying an overhand knot. Um, where now, if you want to describe how to make your, your fart machine, you take the video on how to use a pair of pliers, the video on how to uh, uh, tie a rubber band in a knot, and you sort of string those subroutines together to be able to describe how to make any project. Um, I don't know whether this works. It's just something I'm thinking about. I open it up to people to uh, refute, discuss. Um, 
but sort of that's a, uh, that's sort of fun things to, to play with. So I'll end there. More Great. questions. If not, I'll show other fun videos. <laughs> Actually, I have a question about that last thing. Which okay. Somebody else is speaking. I tried to do that once, uh, showing in a manufacturing class how someone would operate a lathe or a milling machine. Right. Because we started doing it, we realized it was going to take gazillions of hours of video time and editing time to do it, and we kind of got scared by the cost of literally pulling off the project. Do you have any thoughts on uh, how you would do that? Um, I don't. It, uh, I do have a lot of thoughts because, yes, video editing is time-consuming, expensive, etc., etc., etc. We are actually, uh, my company has started a website called Instructables. Um, we're working with people like Make Magazine, etc. And I think the only practical way to really get everything is to Wikipedia the project. And so we're sort of thinking of Instructables where the... It, I'll test this tag on you guys. You can tell me this is good or bad. You know where Wikipedia is descriptive, um, you know, or in an encyclopedic sense, we would like something that is instructive. Yes. Yeah, and then, yeah, yeah. then uh, open up to the community, yeah, get them all to add little videos. Yeah. Uh, you're probably all yeah. watching or monitoring yeah. Google video type thing. Yeah. Um, for the kids version, where it's a much smaller subset, you don't yeah. have to teach them how to run a Herco mill yeah. or a, this type of lay. So. If, that's, if it's just scissors and knots and yeah, yeah, yeah. cardboard, I think we can probably get away with maybe 500, um, and we're going to do it that way. And then, uh, turns out that making animated film, and I guess if you drive past Pixar, you can see this immediately, making animated film is about 10 times the cost of making real film. So that's why we're going with this uh, sort of pseudo-animated look, where we film it, and then just algorithmically convert it into cartoon. So that... That lowers the cost, gives you a distinct look. Um, <coughs> okay. Yeah. And then it'll have an informal feeling anyway, right? For the kids thing, it's all about making it informal, and we really, you know, we just want to encourage the kids to hack. Don't be afraid of tearing things apart and breaking them, and um, don't be afraid of making things. Are you a parent yourself? No, not yet. <laughs> I, was, I was a terrible kid, though. <laughs> Look, I have a comment. Have you seen, there's a company out, I think it's uh, MSC, that makes uh, physics simulations, which essentially gives you a toolbox uh, of, uh, you know, physical connections. Right. That behaves uh, as natural physics does, and you can change all the constants. In. That's essentially this. You can build anything you want and test it uh, in its actual movements. Right. So that's interesting. I, I, I'm aware of another physics simulator, I think a guy called Hodlewson was working on. Um, for a tablet PC where you could draw the mechanism and it would run. It was a very interesting interface where literally you would hand draw your linkages, your four bar linkage, and then draw the force, force vectors and it would solve for it with a physics engine within, which was a kind of neat uh, educational tool. Um, but yeah, I think with that, my emphasis is much more on just physically building things than running the simulations. I prefer the simulation to be the act of cutting it, putting it simulating. Um, future is so, it's going to be so wild you won't understand it. In 15 years we're going to be able to reprogram the bacteria in your, in your gut to express peppermint so your shit won't stink. <laughs> <laughs> and if you actually look at this and you look at the progress in synthetic biology, this is, is actually concerned. The future is so, it's going to be so wild you won't understand it. In 15 years we're going to be able to reprogram the bacteria in your, in your gut to express peppermint so your shit won't stink. <laughs> and if you actually look at this and you look at the progress in synthetic biology, this is, is actually conceivable, right? And if that is actually conceivable, the future is so out of your mind, right? It's, it, it, it's a little hard to, to understand. I think that was a hardware problem, not a software problem. <laughs> I'd say, yeah. um, but anyway, so we, we actually ended up talking a lot yesterday about personal fabrication and open source hardware and what that might mean. Um, I think there's a, a lot of people think that means everyone's going to have a 3D printer that can print magically in all materials and you'll just 
take your phone and you'll put it in your 3D printer replicator and another phone will come out that works. Um, I don't think that's really what's going to happen. Um, in the sense, I think it's more, that'll just be an expensive device and be flaky and you'll have to throw out your HP 3D printer every six months the way you throw out your current HP printer every six months. Um, but, so I, I don't know whether everyone's going to have this magic machine in their basement, but I, I do think there's going to be a, a huge amount more uh, of consumers becoming designers. And some consumers um, rich, literally do lead design, so in, especially in extreme sports like kite surfing and cycling, etc., a lot of the consumers end up doing all the new product development, and a lot of those companies now realise that. Um, but I think it's going to be about giving those consumers the design tools that help them do that design and share it in a way that perhaps you, you, this requires new licensing models where you, you, if you're a lead user who's doing some of the development, you may get some revenue from that or you may just do it for fun. But in reality, I think as a, uh, as a populist, humanity has done a very bad job on collaborative design tools today. I don't think anything really exists very well. But there's a lot of people starting to think about it a lot right now. So I think what we're going to see is a lot of interesting attempts and there's going to be a whole lot of failed efforts and my company may do some of those failed efforts in how you do collaborative design so that you can have a whole lot more people designing um, you know, open source products, if you like. Um, I know on our, on our Instructables website, someone posted a project last week that I thought was kind of stupid. Um, but ends up being an amazingly popular. This was something called LED throwies. So some kid in New York took LEDs, strapped them to a very simple battery, put a magnet on it, and you have handfuls of these things and you throw them at walls or cars and they stick all over the place. Um, and within two weeks and like four million website hits, there are now two Chinese manufacturers competing <laughs> to convert that into a product. So what you might rudely say is the 3D printer slash shelf the, the, the magic phone replicator is actually Chinese factories. Um, and it will be an interest, it's an interesting version of product design, right? So some guy for fun hacks this thing in his basement, he might, or some girl who's doing a project to make a magazine hacks something in their basement, and it gets picked up by someone who has experience in manufacturing and converted into a product. Um, the early users are all going to get disgruntled because they'll think I invented it. Um, as, mu as much as you can invent an LED wire for battery. So, I don't know. Um, so that's to say, it's no one really knows exactly, but I think it's going to be more about making the design the collaboration tools. Um, yes, I do think, you know, if you watch the, the cost of laser cutters, it's gone from 60000 you could buy one for 12000 now, that's in three years. 3D printers, you can now buy one for $20,000. Um, just as a weekend hack in grad school, we made a 3D printer that prints chocolate to a millimeter resolution out of Lego, like $100 worth of Lego. So you can conceivably imagine that um, people will literally have a water jet and a 3D printer. The, the lead users may have a water jet and a 3D printer and a laser cutter for $1,000 or $2,000 as part of their home toolbox, right? I, I do in my home toolbox. Um, but that will, the cost is coming down pretty interestingly on that. So some of the users will, but ultimately it's about going to be about the design. That was a really long-winded way of saying I don't know. Um, there was another question. Yeah, yes. uh, more, more towards the hardware on your optical products, and instead of making a final lens, can you use that to make a hard dye, say if we're making polycarbonate lenses, um, or other objects? You, you can, if you're going to make the hard die, sort of the diamond uh, turning machines now can actually produce the hard molds very cheaply. Um, the principal advantage in that system is to sort of cover a population of eyes. There's a lot of, I really could have given, I probably should have given a whole hour on that talk to cover a lot of questions, but uh, just to cover a single vision lenses, so that's just sphere and cylinder. Um, you need about 1,000 or 1,200 different lens surfaces. So right now, you make all of those and you diamond turn them in glass and they end up becoming your master molds that you cast your acrylic or your polycarbonate from. Um, but that leads to very high inventory costs and, you have, and, and for each of those molds, it turns out to be very expensive. If you start adding higher order lenses, surfaces such as uh, progressive bifocals, etc., that 1,200 goes to, you really want millions of mold surfaces. Um, what we're trying to do is invert the problem, make 
a mole, a single mole that's very cheap that can do all of those surfaces and potentially do it in the field, etc. It's still, the jury is out whether that will end up being the right approach. You could almost argue that the testing device is more important because if you can test everyone everywhere, you know, put it into the Asian manufacturing replicator, three-day FedEx to anywhere in the world, as long as you have the data or the prescription, you just send it, uh, you get it sent. And that, that may be the, the best solution. Um, so, again, I, I don't have a, a firm answer for you, but uh, being able to do the complex 3D surfaces, however, that may be where that technology has a niche because um, in the, in the like I mentioned, instead of being a thousand lens moles, you need, you need a million. Each one of those becomes more expensive because they're now 3D topologies, which is more expensive to mill or, or turn. And so in that niche, that may be an interesting technology. And you may, in fact, use it, like you say, to make the master moles. Yeah, well, yeah Brian, you may be the last question. Okay. So this is kind of going back to the open source engineering, but in an academic university environment, it's sort of all about open sourcing engineering, right? publishing in journals and research labs. And I feel like, this is maybe my personal opinion, but uh, a lot of journal articles I read now are not very enabling. There's kind of so much background information that gets left out. And I was wondering, like, what from your instructables experience could you take and apply maybe to academia? Maybe like the kind of paradigm of how we're publishing our research at labs is changing with the web and you know, projects involving software and lots of code behind it that doesn't always lend itself to Right. So, thank you for pointing out the, the slides I didn't show you. <laughs> um, I do think a lot about that, and specifically on the academic research side, and, and I actually started a project called ThinkCypher at MIT, that was another aborted attempt at building collaborative tools, because it is actually hard to build these collaborative tools. Um, but we, uh, if you haven't read this article, Vannevar Bush, Atlantic Monthly 945, um, you really should. I guess every web web guru ever has read this article, but I think it actually applies to hardware. So Vannevar Bush, president of MIT, post-World War II, just dropped the bomb, everyone's depressed and elated because the war's over, but we now have a nuclear world. He says, well, what do we do with all these great engineering powers? And in this article, he outlines uh, a concept called the Memex. He basically says, every researcher in the world should have this set suite of tools that documents everything they do and makes it shareable, right? He basically described the ultimate internet for researchers, um, where literally, you know, it auto-documents what, um, how many moles of this and uh, how many grams of that you're using and makes, uh, makes that shareable. But um, we sort of have tried to do that with the methods section of a paper. I don't know about you, but as a grad student, I tried to reproduce a lot of people's methods. Yeah. And... Uh, I don't think it is very often the complete code. Yeah. Um, so that's a hard problem. I, and, I, and, the, and I think a lot of it's probably socially worth figuring out how to make those method sections reproducible and doing it. I, we have been talking with the Public Library of Science people, which is an interesting new open source model for academic publishing, about building or, or making instructable tools specifically designed for them so that in the Public Library of Science method sections. Uh, the methods will be essentially uh, opened, and, and people will be able to say, "Well, actually, um, you know, it's not 260 degrees for eight minutes, but you now I found that it's 263 degrees for seven and a half minutes." And you you could add the sort of Wikipedia aspect to it. So that's kind of where our thinking is. I would love to see it happen. It's a great frustration, as it sounds it is with you, that it's it's not quite working yet. Um, just to add on to that, um, I'm very cynical, unfortunately. So right. I think a lot of the time that's, that's intentional when you, when you read these papers. I think it is intentional. The, the obfuscation is horrible. Yeah. And it's because, well, if we've done this, but we really don't want you doing that. Right. So how do you fight that mindset, which is seems to be fairly pervasive? Well, I think the, <coughs> the, I don't think you can fight the original obfuscation a lot. But if you have other people who have tried to reproduce the results, eventually they all figure it out. It's like the Wikipedia model people yeah. working on all these problems. And they will be highly motivated to expose the obfuscation. Right. <laughs> and uh, you almost, it, you know, you get a nice little bit of competition where they will reveal the obfuscation and say, look, oh, those Harvard guys, they were terrible. Um, or whatever. No, you're right. That's what happens at conferences a lot. Yeah. 
you end up talking to people and saying, did you try that? So I think the real challenge is how do you make these documentation systems less effort than the way you currently document things, right? Uh, and I think that's a hard problem. It's got a whole lot of user interface stuff in it. Uh, it's unsolved, but uh, there are people who are starting to think about it more and more, which is good. Let's hang up there, because I see people are drifting out. With sure. Maybe you wanted to say a little bit. Let me just, okay. Just one. Just one. Just one. Oh, you want to get your pen? Oh, oh. <laughs> <laughs> I, I thought this was a must pen. Thanks very much for coming, and a final round of applause.